Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about three grandchildren. And um, I'm going to tell that story through a lens that I think you will find, uh, to me, is very interesting and somewhat moving. The first grandchild is me. Uh, I am a grandchild, and uh, this is a fact, I'm a grandchild of the Weizmann. Not very many people know this. My mentor who I met last week, uh, Paul Berg, uh, was at the Weizmann. For a long time, actually, he spent a significant amount of his sabbaticals uh, at the Weizmann. And in fact, I saw him in California this week. Paul uh, is the person who invented recombinant DNA technology, genetic engineering, the entire field. Um, spent a significant amount of time there. Uh, so I have, have, a, have a lineage of descent from the Weizmann. That's the first grandchild. But I'll move on to two more grandchildren as we go along with my slides. The question that is on everyone's minds, I think, constantly is, where are we on cancer? Our news is inundated about news about cancer. We hear about it every day. And when I was writing my book, I felt we had lost the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest. We didn't know which direction. We didn't know whether we were moving backwards, forward, sideways. And that's the question that's really burning on us. We needed a landscape map, a road map, to tell us where are we, how did we get here, and what happens next. And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about my views about this. Uh, and I'm going to try to project out into the future about what happens next, I think, um, in this disease that has lived with us for a very, very long time. Cancer is not a modern disease. Uh, we think of it as a modern illness. In fact, it's an ancient illness. It was present not only in an old document, it's present in one of the oldest medical documents we own, the Edwin Smith papyrus, which describes a woman with breast cancer. It's also present in ancient specimens. We know it to be a fact because it's present in actual, the actual tumors can be found. That's a picture of a bone tumor from a mummy from 2000 BC. And in fact, just as there, were, there was cancer in the ancient world, there were theories of cancer in the ancient world. Um, and there was always a link between trying to understand the, the project of reason to try to understand what cancer is and therefore how to treat cancer. Uh, Galen and Vesalius, the great surgeons, um, tried to create theories of cancer. And one of the most prominent theories of cancer, the longest theory that actually ever existed, was the idea that cancer was a disease caused by an excess of black bile in the body. So Galen famously claimed that there were only four fluids, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And all of pathology could be explained by the systemic alteration of these four fluids. I call it a hydraulic theory of pathology. One goes up, one goes down, and therefore you have anything. Galen also hypothesized that there was only one other disease that would be tracked back to an excess of black bile, and that was depression. And there's something very moving about the idea that right from the ancient world, cancer and depression were linked in this way in psychic and uh, humoral theories of, of black bile. But I like to think about the history of cancer, the whole spectrum, as it were, to condense it down into four basic movements, or the four basic movements of a sonata. The first movement of that appears sometime in the 1860s and 1870s. We think of this as something quite taken. We were, it's an idea that's percolated so much that we actually have assumed that it's to be true. But in, in the 1860s and 1870s, when it was first discovered, this was a deeply radical idea about cancer. Remember, people thought it was black bile, humors, something in the air, a malfeasance, etc. And then all of a sudden, a young man, not young in this picture, but a young man, 32 years old, Rudolf Virchow, in Berlin, looked down the microscope, and he found something that was really surprising at the time. And that was that regardless of where these cancers seemed to come from, melanoma, breast cancer, leukemia, cancer of the blood, they all had a common link. And the common link was that there was an overproduction, overproliferation of cells. Cells were growing where they should not be growing. And he hypothesized, again, a radical hypothesis for his time, that cancer was therefore a disease of cellular origin. Somewhere in the body, a cell started to grow where it shouldn't be growing, and it couldn't stop growing, and therefore that was the, the origin of cancer. He had a theory about that. He called this omnis cellula is cellula. From cells come more cells. And that was the origin of the pathological, uh, the pathological proliferation called cancer. And of course, as I said, there's always a match between theory and practice in cancer. Uh, and that, that theory led to the golden age of cancer surgery, the hypothesis being that if cancer originates locally in a cell that doesn't know how to stop dividing, then taking out that cell or the family of cells around it would therefore cure cancer. 
It's an important theory, and this, of course, led to the great surgical uh, operations for cancer. This is a picture of Bill Roth operating in Vienna. Already we've seen the, we're beginning to see the global reach of this disease. Bill Roth operating in Vienna. And Bill Roth was visited in his uh, Vienna uh, clinic by a young man who would leave his real mark on cancer surgery, and that was William Stuart Halstead. Halstead was a surgeon who was originally in New York, practiced not far from here, and then moved to, the, uh, moved to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, where he set up probably the most important cancer surgery uh, discipline, cancer surgery clinic of its time. And here he is again operating on breast cancer. Now, Halstead's theory of cancer, if you really remember this theory, because it'll come back to us, Halstead's theory of cancer followed that idea. Cancer is a disease of cells. It originates in cells. It originates in a nidus. And if you remove that nidus of proliferating cells, you'll cure cancer. And Halstead made a very important corollary from this statement, and that was that if you, if you cut more of the nidus out, you'll cure more cancer. That if you move much more of the tissue, and in fact, he argued that the reason that women were not being cured for breast cancer, okay, breast cancer was something particularly that Halstead was interested in, was because they were not, the surgeon was not cutting enough, and he called it mistaken kindness. And he began to therefore extend the boundaries of the surgery towards not only the mastectomy, the removal of the breast, but to ultimately a super radical and an ultra radical mastectomy. Again, in service of the theory that if, that, that if cancer originated in a single cell, then cutting more cells would mean removing the cancer. Now the problem, of course, which we'll come to in a second, was that there was, the theory was all correct, except for one very, very important conceptual error. And it's a conceptual error that goes back in some ways to Galen, and that is that cancer does originate, of course, in a single cell. It's a proliferation of a single cell. But it also has a systemic component, the black bile thing that Galen was talking about. And that is that it tends to spread outside that single point. And therefore, if you take a woman, if a woman happens to have metastatic breast cancer, which is, of course, a, lots of women present with metastatic breast cancer, then cutting more local breast cancer won't save her life because the disease has already moved outside the body. And this was a conceptual error. It was a cycle of conceptual errors that Halstead was stuck in. And not only Halstead, this is a whole series of physicians of that time. And so while they were able to perform extremely aggressive surgery, more and more aggressive surgery, putting literally tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of women under the knife to, in order to really take out the cancer from the body, they really could not cure that fraction of breast cancer that had already moved outside the into the metastatic realm. So already there was a challenge to this original theory that yes, cancer was a disease of cells, but there had to be something more. There had to be something systemic about cancer and that we had to attack cancer in a systemic way. And this was shown by a series of trials. It took 100 years to run these trials. This was shown by a series of trials which were performed first in the United States, in Canada, in Israel, ultimately which showed that regardless of whether you perform more and more, more and more aggressive local surgery, it did not really cure cancer when it had spread out that of, of the local sites. And similarly, at that same time, there were a series of uh, advancements in, in local therapy for cancer. This is a picture of Marie Curie uh, and a picture of one of, her, one of the early radiation devices. And here, too, very successful at killing and curing local uh, cancers, still used. This child is from the 1950s, actually, being treated for an eye tumor, still survives today, but would begin to fail once the cancer had spread outside the local site in the body. So then the question arose, could there be a systemic therapy? Could there be a systemic therapy? And Willie Meyer, who practiced in New York as well, began to wonder, he was a breast cancer surgeon, and wondered, could there be a therapy that would be more than just local therapy, that would augment local therapy for cancer? And perhaps in a curious or an ironic twist to the story, the first, local, the first systemic therapies would literally come out of war gas. As we talk about the war on cancer, in a kind of ironic twist to the story, the first systemic therapies were, in fact, war gases. This is a picture of a bombing at Bari Harbor, where um, uh, some mustard gas was released on Allied soldiers. And very soon after, pathologists uh, noted that, in fact, these soldiers who had survived the war gas bombings had a, had a profound depletion of their white blood cells. And this was a time when, of course, this was a time when any poison any cellular poison, because cancer was a cellular growth problem, any cellular poison, such as a war gas, could be evaluated as an anti-cancer agent. Um, so it was a very promising lead. And in fact, very quickly, these war gases were adapted for therapy 
for the, um, for, the, uh, for the use systemic therapy as chemotherapy, and this is the birth of chemotherapy for cancer. And in fact, diluted versions of these mustard gases were used in the 1940s and 1950s as agents that would stop the growth of cancer cells. And they were successful. The first ones were quite successful, but unfortunately, the patients still died afterwards. They would have a remission followed by a death afterwards. So there was a tantalizing hint that if you could stop the growth of these cancer cells and somehow consolidate that, that, that blockage of growth, you would get to a complete cure for cancer in addition to surgery and radiation therapy. Um, which brings me to the second, the second grandchild. It's an interesting story. Uh, in the 1940s, following these leads, um, a physician named Sidney Farber began to, he was in Boston that time, he began to work on trying to find other such chemical poisons, cellular poisons, poisons of cellular growth that would inhibit the growth of cells, normal cells and can cancer cells, but in doing so, kill cancer, sparing mostly normal cells. So trying to figure out, could there be, this was, this was like, a, like a narrow wedge that was driven, a narrow pharmacological wedge that was driven to kill cancer cells, spare normal cells, and thereby deliver systemic therapy against cancer. Now, Farber, interesting story himself, uh, was a, um, Farber, when he was, a, was born in Buffalo, and at this was a time when it was very, very difficult for Jewish medical students to get um, slots uh, in medical schools in the United States. So in fact, Farber had to go to Israel, and he was partly, for, for some time, he, was, he worked with people who were actually the, among the founders of the Weizmann. Uh, he went there for a while. He was there in the 1930s and 1940s, and then went, came back to the United States, and then only then, after he'd completed much of his medical training, was able to come back to the United States. But I'm not, I'm not at the grandchild yet. So it turned out that Sidney Farber began to explore these new chemicals, these new anti-proliferative anti chemicals, anti-chemicals that would kill cellular growth. And he found one such chemical in collaboration with an Indian chemist and, uh, up in, uh, up in uh, New York, and he began to use these chemicals for the first time in treating a very, very aggressive variant of leukemia called acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It's a disease that I treat still, ALL. That's a very, remember that disease, ALL, we'll come back to it. And he began to inject the first children with these therapies, and he again found profound remissions. Uh, unfortunately, they would all relapse and die afterwards. But once again, this idea that if you use a, a chemical, a chemical inhibitor of cellular growth, you can kill cancer cells, maybe spare some normal cells, and if you do it with an extreme precision, you could cure or even get into remission some of these uh, children. So I became interested in finding out that the child, who was the first child to receive this uh, therapy, because he's in some ways, in some ways he's an intellectual grandfather for us. Uh, he is the person who originated, the first patient to try it, and I became obsessed with this idea while I was writing my book. Um, and I um, knew that the child had lived in Boston, and I knew his name was R.S., uh, because they had, in, in Farber's papers, the names are all made into initials, and I knew his name was R.S. So this was, I call this the hunt for R.S. I began to hunt for this child, because I need to know the story of this child in order to recreate and bring him alive to some extent. And I began to write emails uh, frantically in, this, in 2005, 2006, and uh, there was nothing, no response. Um, so I was in Boston, I was in the library working on my book then, and I thought, well, you know, um, I got dejected, this was 2006, I, I went to my parents' house in Delhi, and someone told me, remember the Indian chemist that Farber had collaborated with? Someone told me that, that Indian chemist has only one biographer in the entire world, and happened to live five blocks from my parents' house. So I said, okay, fine, I'll go and visit this chemist, this biographer of this chemist, the chemist had died, unfortunately, and, um, spent the entire evening with him, I left, um, and he, as I was leaving, he said to me, again, remember, this is 6,000 miles away from, from where this clinic was. He says to me, oh, you know, in the 1970s, I visited Sidney Farber's clinic, and I have a roster of all the patients he was treating. Uh, would you like to look at this roster? And in that roster was this photograph of a child whose name is Robert Sandler. And that was that first child. His name is Robert Sandler. Um, so he is the second grandchild of the Weizmann. Um, he uh, lived for about uh, seven months after his treatment. And you can say seven months, you know, who cares about seven months? For a child with acute lymphoblastic leukemia in the 1940s and 1950s, seven months was a lifetime. No one had ever survived two weeks or three weeks after the disease. This was considered a dramatic uh, 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 result, temporary remission. This was the paper uh, written about it. And, uh, and therefore, I dedicated my book to Robert Sandler. My book opens with a quote 
for, for him, to Robert Sandler, to those who came before and after him. Now, the, this is a circular story because, of course, the child was in Boston. I came back to Boston, and I could go 15 minutes away from where I was working. I could go and find actually where the child lives, lived, um, and so forth. Um, but there's another circle in this story. I want to pause for one second to finish this circle. About a month after my book was published, I was working in my laboratory, actually on ALL. Uh, we, we work on the same disease. And uh, I got a phone call in my office from this gentleman. And it was the other twin. It's the twin of, the, of Robert Sandler. His name is Elliot Sandler. Now, now imagine this disjunctive moment. He walked into a bookstore. He lives in Maine. I never would have found him. Uh, he's not listed anywhere. Um, and opened a book and found the book dedicated to his own twin brother. Right? Because the, I, so anyway, he got in touch with me. Um, and, uh, and then we've had a conversation since then. Um, I don't know. Some people might know Ken Burns is doing a film on cancer on my book. And in fact, the film opens with Elliot Sandler's uh, memory of Robert Sandler's uh, remission. So the second grandchild, keep that thought. I'll come back to him again. Um, now, this idea that you could use cytotoxic poisons, cellular poisons against cancer, killing cancer cells, growing cancer cells, and sparing normal cells, was really taken to its nth place, its zenith, by further trials that added not one, but several, and this is the birth of combination chemotherapy. It's a word we'd understand every day, but of course, this is where it was born. And Fry and Freireich, Emil Fry and Freireich, both working at the National Cancer Institute then, began to extend this idea, adding not one, but two, three, four, and in the case of ALL, seven such anti-cellular proliferative drugs to keep adding to the armamentarium and driving this narrow pharmacological wedge between killing cancer cells, sparing normal cells. And in fact, in this disease, more than any other disease, in this one disease for childhood leukemia, childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia, they were able to start getting cures, miraculous cures. So the survival rate from childhood ALL in the 1950s was 0%, 0% when that child came in. Every child with ALL died of ALL within weeks, sometimes within months. By the 1960s, the survival rate had climbed up to 40%. By the 1970s, to 80%. And we're now about 85 to 90%. 85 to 90% of these children are now cured by using cytotoxic chemotherapy, anti-proliferative cytotoxic chemotherapy, a, a massive collaboration around the world of, of driving this effort forward bit by bit by bit by bit. Uh, and this, was, this really created a kind of uh, groundswell across the world again, but particularly in the United States, of the idea that you could, you could now pour pour money into cancer research. Uh, patients became involved. Patient advocates became involved. And this was the founding of the war on cancer. This is Mary Lasker, who, of course, has been called a fairy god, mother of medical research, lived again a few blocks uptown from here, and really began to use everything at her disposal, her wealth, but more importantly, her charm, her friendships, to really move. She was not a scientist, but a friend of the scientists. I began to move the frontier of cancer forward. Leading, she was actually a big collaborator of Sydney Farber's. She and Sydney Farber combined their efforts together to launch what we now call the War on Cancer. In 1969, if you were to wake up in the morning, you would open the New York Times or the Washington Post, and you would have this full-page advertisement, Mr. Nixon, you can cure cancer. And there you have, in the 1960s, both the optimism that you can combine, that, you, that we knew enough about cancer, that you could combine these cancer therapies, these cellular poisons of cellular growth, that you could, in fact, by combining them, you would not cure, just, not cure just childhood leukemia, but all the other cancers, as if the key to the lock had been found. But unfortunately, that key has, was not found. So this is what happened. This is the increase of the National Cancer Institute budget following the so-called war on cancer. And these are the actual effects on cancer mortality starting in the 1970s, moving out to the early 1990s, sorry, mid-1990s for men and for women. The blue curve is the actual mortality rate, the red curve of the expected mortality rate. So absolutely a difference, but a, a plateauing. This is not the curve that looks like this, falling down rapidly. And even this curve, and we should keep the perspective on this, even this curve is complex. So if you look at what this really means and split it up by cancers, you begin to see a pattern. And we'll come back to this pattern. And that is that for some cancers, this is lung cancer over here, dramatic declines in death, caused by, of course, 
changes in smoking habits. For some cancers, leukemia here, this line over here, leukemia, uh, the decline caused by treatment. Other cancers like breast cancer, a combination of screening, treatment, prevention, and so forth. So you begin to see that not every cancer is equal, that there is, even in the response to these dramatically improved therapies, that there was a divergence or a, or a split. And so this led to the second phase, or the second theory of, of cancer, and that is cancer is not just a disease of cells, but there's something underneath that. If you open up the cell and ask the question, why is that cell dividing abnormally? You find that, in fact, it's dividing abnormally because the genes that control cellular growth, adding and subtracting growth signals to cells, those genes have been disrupted in cancer. Now, again, many of you might find this idea very simple. Uh, it's very much part of our, uh, our, our public vocabulary now. But in the 1970s, when this was announced, it was a deeply radical idea that, in fact, the very genes that control normal cellular growth, if you disrupt those genes, you get cancerous cellular growth. So in fact, a cell can be imagined in our bodies as, as, as a computer that interprets growth signals. This is one of the fundamental things that every cell does. And it interprets growth signals by taking in some stuff from the environment and saying, should I grow or should I not grow? Every cell is making that decision. And cancer is when that decision goes wrong, when, when mutations in genes cause an alteration in that decision, and therefore the cell now begins to proliferate abnormally. This was work done through multiple years, between 1970 and 1990, by multiple people. But I like this quote from Harold Varmus, which says that ultimately, this is the challenge of cancer. Cancer is a distorted version of normalcy. And therefore, no matter how much you drive those original chemotherapies, those chemotherapies that would kill cells, you can never get away from the fact that cancer is a twin to us. It is a distortion of normalcy because growth is required for every body to heal, to reproduce, to grow. And this brings us to the third phase of, of, of this revolution, which is that by the 1990s, it was clear that not one gene, we talked briefly about this two-hit hypothesis, but by 1990s, it was clear that not one gene is enough, that in fact more than one gene is enough, more than one gene is required. So by the 1990s, we knew certainly that alteration in growth controlling genes cause cancer, the very genes that make our hands grow, our brains grow. If you mutate them, you will now get a cell that doesn't know how to stop dividing, stop growing. But the question was how many of them are there and how common are they? So this is the, the uh, multi-hit hypothesis that we talked about, and that is a very simple idea, and that is that every cell contains not one growth signal, but many growth signals. It's a computer, as I said. It is interpreting growth signals from the environment, and multiple growth signals are integrated, much like an integrated unit might figure out how to assess these signals, and it, the cell then makes a decision to grow or not grow, to grow or die. And unfortunately, fortunately for us, there are many, many genes that control growth. And in fact, cancer only arises not by one gene mutation, but by multiple gene mutations. They, in fact, are they're natural safeguards, as it were, in our body, because growth is such a complex process that you need to disrupt multiple signals to finish up, ultimately, getting a cell that's cancer. These are multiple mutations. So now I'm going to spend two minutes giving you the genomic view of cancer. By genome, I mean every gene, not one gene, but all the genes in the human body, and talk a little bit about how we see, how I see, how the world sees cancer today. And I remember we've come such a long way from that simple idea cancer originates in one cell as cellular growth. And this is, stay with me for a second because this is, I think, a very important series of slides, and it'll, it'll set up the basis for the last section. And that is that imagine a patient comes in with, uh, uh, with, with you have breast cancer, say, and you have the capacity, which we do now, of taking every gene, this is a blank sheet of paper to start with, taking every gene in the human body, starting with the first gene here and the last gene there, and marking out the single mutations, the single changes in the growth controlling genes that this woman has. And there are here about 10 odd genes, and that's what you, you do. Now, here's the point. A second woman comes in, also with breast cancer. Verkau looks down the microscope at her breast cancer, and they're identical looking. Every breast cancer looks to him, this exactly the same, malignant proliferations of cells, and now you perform this, a genetic map of her cancer, and you see reassuringly that these genes are the same, still breast cancer, but here's one gene that's popped up that is unique to her. Here's another gene that's only unique to this one specimen of breast cancer, even though anatomically, microscopically, these two diseases look identical under the microscope. You do a third patient, and now you begin to encounter 
what we are encountering as the next challenge, which is that cancer is a, gene, is a, is a disease of genomes, not just one gene, but many genes, and there is enormous diversity between individual specimens of the same cancer. The diversity, in fact, mimics the diversity of human beings themselves. So, in other words, every cancer at a genetic level is its own cancer. And that begins to tell us why we're in this place today. It is not a disease, unlike many other diseases, not a disease of one gene, it is not a disease, it is a disease of multiple genes, and these genes happen to be the very same genes that control growth. And that is the challenge. The challenge is how do we then create therapies that are specific to one person and yet can encompass multiple cancers or multiple specimens of the same cancer. This is that same view now, uh, flattened out into a single sheet as it were. You can take the ones that are very common, make them big peaks, take the ones that are uncommon, make them small peaks, and that's what the cancer genome looks like. This is colorectal cancer, it's true for breast cancer, it's true for leukemia. This is, this is, this is called a landscape view. It's been pioneered by several scientists, Bert Vogelstein and others, but here you have the landscape view of cancer, and now you have big peaks, for very commonly altered genes in colorectal cancer, intermediate size peaks, and then these small little dots, which are unique to one particular specimen. So now you begin to understand the challenge that we face as oncologists. But obviously, when these maps began to be known, the first question was, could you direct uh, chemicals, specific chemicals, against these very commonly altered genes? And this would be like killing cancer with an Achilles heel uh, as opposed to a, a bomb, right? So now you find the exact mutations, the exact mutations that are causing these alterations in cellular growth, and can you now target them using new molecular therapies and start killing cancer cells? And in fact, that has started being done. I call this the age of targeted therapy as opposed to the general killers of cellular proliferating cells with a disease called acute promyelocytic leukemia, one of the first ones to start this. Actually, breast cancer with hormonal therapy is one, another example, and has become extremely, uh, you know, really entered our vocabulary, really, with a drug called chronic myelogenous leukemia and a drug called Gleevec, sorry, a disease called chronic myelogenous leukemia and a drug for Gleevec, which, and, you know, it's, to me, it's kind of beautiful because this is the actual gene, or protein, rather, which, is, which drives the cancer cells, one of these big mutations in, in chronic uh, myelogenous leukemia, and it literally looks to me like an arrow driven into a heel. Uh, this is a drug that will bind to the cleft of that protein, inactivate that protein, and thereby drive this CML into a profound remission, a profound remission. Um, and that is the product of, these, uh, of understanding the cancer genome to this, uh, to this point in this day and age. And this has been true for breast cancer, too. This is a, a woman treated with a, a, an antibody that targets one such mutation, less common among all breast cancers, but still quite common. Um, and she had a breast cancer 16 years ago, a 16-year survivor of metastatic breast cancer. In Halstead's clinic, she would have had an eviscerating mastectomy and still died afterwards because, of course, her disease had already spread outside her body. But even that now has had challenges. So this is the age of targeted therapy, and we're leaving even that behind, because here is Gleevec for CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, patients not treated versus patients treated. You see a huge difference in survival. This is breast cancer with that second drug I talked about, Herceptin. Patients treated versus not treated, again, a huge difference in survival, but unlike Gleevec, where the patients live and live and live forever, even patients treated with Herceptin for metastatic breast cancer don't live as long. It's now we're cut down to 50 months as opposed to 72 odd months. And this is melanoma. It shows you the melanoma is, you know, the, the, the latest, uh, it is a disease that we are now beginning to pour resources into. And again, you see with targeted therapy, increases in survival, but in the end, the patients seem to acquire resistance to these targeted therapies. And now we're down to 12, 15, 17 months. So we are now moving into yet another phase, trying to reimagine cancer, saying, okay, the, the age of cells is over, the age of genes is over, the age of genomes is over, what do we do next? And now we've come to a stage in which scientifically, my laboratory, other laboratories have begun to realize that even targeted therapy isn't enough. We'll have to do one more piece beyond targeted therapy to get to that final step. And I like to think of this as cancer as an organismal disease, and that is that it's not just genes, it's not just cells, it's not just genomes, it's the entire organism that needs to be considered. Cancer arises not in a vacuum, it arises in, the, in, arises in real patients, in real human beings, and interacts with environments. It's, it's alive in the same way that the cells, the rest of the cells of our body is alive. So 
An organism, of course, pertains to an organism as a whole. It's uh, physiology, it's environment, it's interactions. We live by complex physiological pathways. We live within complex networks. There's an immune system that we possess. We possess in micro environments. Our body is divided into or organs. Uh, and the stomach is very different from the muscle, for instance. And that we interact with complex environments. And this has led to the idea that cancer is not just, shouldn't be considered just a, as I said, a cell growing in a vacuum, proliferating without any cause or reason, but in fact, a cell growing in the context of other mutations, a cell growing in the context of other cells. And this has created these, these, these diagrams, which lo look to some people as impossibly complex, but in fact are beginning to capture the true complexity of cancer in its environment. Now you could say, well, that's great. That's wonderful. What do we do with this information? But in fact, this information is actionable. And I'll show you one important actionable piece of this information, and that is that we're now beginning to imagine cancer as not just one piece. Here and somewhere in here sa it says, insensitivity to growth inhibitors and self-sufficiency of growth signals. So it's not just growth, right? But in fact, there's a microenvironment. It metastasizes, it resists cellular death, and it sustains abnormal blood vessel formation. And that is what is, what is, what is causing cancer. This diagram, by the way, is a very important diagram, and, and uh, Dr. Dumani will talk a little bit more about it, has been called the hallmarks of cancer diagram. And that is that cancer is not just abnormal, abnormalities in growth, but in fact, it's abnormalities in multiple axes of cellular physiology, organismal physiology, including tissue invasion, microenvironment, apoptosis, angiogenesis, these words that will come up later in the, in the, in the following sessions. But let me end then with the story of the third grandchild, and that is a woman named Emma Whitehead. I'll tell you Emma Whitehead's story, and that's the last story I'm going to tell you today. So going back to this idea of the hallmarks of cancer, cancer is not just a disease of abnormal proliferation of cells, not just an abnormal abnormal accumulation of mutations in gene, not just, not just abnormal genomes, but in fact an abnormal organismal disease. So this is a young lady who also had leukemia, ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She's eight years old, lives in Philadelphia, and she was treated, much as Sydney Farber's patients would have been treated, with um, things that uh, block the proliferation of cells, standard chemotherapy, killing cells, sparing normal cells, and trying to get her and her first remission lasted about two months. So here's a girl, eight years old, has the first remission, lasts about two months, back in the leukemic phase. They brought her into a second remission and decided to do a bone marrow transplant on her. Um, and they were preparing for that bone marrow transplant. The donor had been prepped uh, for the bone marrow transplant. She was now, in order to do a bone marrow transplant, you need a second remission. They got her into a second remission. The bone marrow was just about to be prepped. She relapsed. So here she relapses twice. And in the standard universe, this would be considered the end. Uh, we, even with ALL, as I said, a disease that we can cure, uh, this, is, this is considered the, the, the recalcitrant variant of ALL. And someone had the idea, and I'll talk about where the idea came from, what if we activate her immune system? Now we've reduced her disease with the usual standard chemotherapies. What if we could activate her immune system and now make her own immune system kill the cancer cells. Now, of course, bone marrow transplant does this, but it does this in a very crude way. Could we activate her immune system very specifically and kill her cancer cells? Now, it turns out, in the 1980s, there was a gentleman, Zelegeshar, who had figured out a way to activate the immune system specifically against cancer cells. This, this research had been very actively pursued and then sort of lapsed because everyone said, oh, you know, these targeted therapies, what a wonderful thing they are, uh, will be able to cure all cancers with targeted therapies. But now, with Emma Whitehead, all of a sudden, she had gotten everything and relapsed right through. And so people, a, a group of uh, uh, physicians, scientists in Philadelphia said, why don't we pick up that molecule that Eshar et, et al. had designed in the 1980s and modify it so that now this molecule can specifically attack her T cells, uh, her, her cancer cells. So this is called chimeric antigen receptor therapy, immunological therapy against cancer. Emma White had received her first dose. And in fact, the agent was so active that she had to go into the ICU because it destroyed all her cancer cells and now released every single cellular metabolite in her body. This was, a, this was the most active reagent that everyone had, anyone had ever used against cancer. So she was put in the ICU and then using the traditional kind of medical therapies, 
uh, that allow us to keep these very sick patients alive, things that we learned from the bone marrow transplant era, we were, the, the, the physicians were able to recover her from the ICU, and she is still alive today. And this is about three years after her transplant uh, with these T cells. So she is the third grandchild uh, of the Weizmann. Um, so this is now, uh, we have designed some of these. Uh, several people have designed these. We're now using these in cancers, uh, diverse kinds of cancers, starting again with blood cancer, and now extending this out paradigm into other cancers. You may have seen a recent report um, in a bile duct cancer, another recent report in pancreatic cancer. And the question is, how can we now capture this organismal aspect of cancer, the fact that cancer lives in real human beings inside real environments, and can we add that to targeted therapy? Can we add that to surgery? Can we add that to cytotoxic therapy? So it's a huge landscape. Uh, we have come a long way, but there is a way, long way to go. Um, and so when I like to think about this, I like to think about this as this is a puzzle that will be with us for a long, long time. It has been with us for a long, long time. And it's really, it is our job to try to solve it. And every generation in which we fail to make an advance is a generation where we will fail to, to make our pact with the future. So I encourage everyone to concentrate on this problem. It is my problem, it is your problem, and try to really try to see if we can now move to the next level or next series of therapies against cancer to bring more grandchildren of various institutes into the world. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you, thank you very much. It's gratifying, I have to say this, as an immunovirologist, immunologist, to see that part now as a new opening and that the Weissman plays such a vital part. You have to realize that Dr. Escher doesn't get the credit. This is in the 70s. And to see it now come about, I'm really pleased that you cited this at the end. It's the new phase, the immune response. And with Michael Sella here being our leading immunologist, it's really a thrill. Anyway, first question. You were talking about treatment. Has there been any investigation? Oh, sorry, thank you. I was saying you're discussing treatment. Has there been any investigation or thought given to prevention? in terms of boosting the immune system in advance? So there has been some thought to prevention. Actually, you know, what's interesting is, to me what's interesting personally, is that the world of prevention and cancer treatment used to be separate silos. We used to think of them, you know, as, as two different buckets, as it were. But that's radically changed. We now know that these are linked together, and they're linked together by the understanding of cause. So I'll give you a couple of examples and tell you a little bit about what happens, what's happening next. One example. We now know that certain cancers, you can activate those same genes, those growth controlling genes, by viruses. Uh, and for a while we thought that they were rare, but in fact it turns out they're quite common. The biggest one that we're working on right now as, as, a, as a large community of oncologists is of course cancer of the cervix, cervical cancer caused by human papillomavirus. Now that's a situation where we, where we started with the cancer, a series of investigations identified the virus, and then the genetic links between the virus and the normal human cell, ultimately leading to a vaccine. And that is an example in which you start off with ideas about prevention, oh, sorry, ideas about treatment and cause, and work backwards, and you actually end up with finding new kinds of prevention. My point is the following. That is to say that it is no longer sensible to think about prevention and treatment as, as, as silos, particularly as opposing silos. You know, there's a, there used to be a time in the 1980s when people would say, every dollar you're giving to treatment is taking a dollar away from prevention. That world is no longer with us. In fact, every dollar that you investigate cancer at a fundamental level leads to new mechanisms of prevention and leads to new mechanisms of treatment. And we have to really rethink the world that way. It's, this is not a mutually opposed planet. I'll give you one more example of that. Um, BRCA1 positivity, uh, breast cancer, uh, very common problem, uh, very common problem in Israel. Um, through a series of trials performed here and in Israel, um, the realization was made that tamoxifen, the very drug that you can use to treat uh, breast cancer, uh, metastatic breast cancer, ER positive breast cancer, can be used as a preventative mechanism for women with genetic predispositions to breast cancer. Not all but some women with genetic predispositions to breast cancer now is dramatically, remarkably successful in doing that. So 
there is really a, a kind of rethinking that's going on in terms of opening up the black box of the cancer cell and now trying to link prevention and treatment at the causal level. And hopefully there will be much more of this. There'll be, there'll be a much, much more integrated effort rather than saying these two are mutually opposing camps. Because come on, we're trying to treat the same disease in the end. Another question? Yes, in the back. Wonderful book and wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, you might want to say a few words about environmental chemical exposures. Many people are interested in this subject. Yep. And also, I wonder if you would consider revising the first half of your lecture in light of the second half, namely to go from talking about cancer in the singular, which has misled most people's scientific and lay understanding of this very large category of very heterogeneous diseases, into talking about cancers in the plural, as you so brilliantly demonstrated in the second half of your same lecture. Well, I try to, I mean, you know, uh, those are helpful comments. I'll, I'll address the second one first. I, I try to, I'm interested in the structure of knowledge, so I try to follow that structure as we move forward. I, I try to follow that structure, including all the errors made and all the misconceptions made, because as I say in my book, the content of scientific knowledge changes all the time, but its form remains the same uh, over time. In other words, it is, I'm absolutely confident that we will make, even in this new era, the mistakes that we made in the past era. That's the only way we, unfortunately, that human knowledge moves forward, that we keep making the same mistakes over and over again, perhaps in a more refined way, and it's skepticism and criticism of our own work that keeps our scientific enterprise alive. So, um, useful comment. Uh, I actually like to show the, I like to show the warts, as it were. Uh, I like to understand them myself. But you're absolutely right that, that we have now know that there is no single cancer, there are multiple yeah, cancers. More. And right. to treat them, we have to think about them as a heterogeneous series of diseases. I'll come back to the first comment quickly. And that is to say, the issue of environmental question is obviously very important. Um, we're stuck a little bit in what I call an epidemiological gap. And this, it's the following. And that is that if a, if a rare chemical exposure causes a dramatic increase in a rare cancer, a relatively rare cancer, such as asbestos and mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. uh, that, we have very good epidemiological devices to spot and clean up and find. If a relatively common cancer, uh, common exposure, causes an increase in a relatively common cancer, that we can spot. The problem is the following. If there's a chemical exposure that causes, let's say, a 10% increase in breast cancer. Now, as a human, carcinogen, and as a public health tragedy, this would be enormous because the denominator is enormous. The number of women with breast cancer is enormous. 10% would be a, a huge number of cases. But our epidemiological tools are poor at capturing that. So there is almost like a, it's, it's like a little blind spot, as it were, in, in our epidemiological tools. And in fact, the sad truth is that since the 1980s and 1990s, we really have not found, and, and mark my words, we really have not found a single major chemical carcinogen for about 15 to 20 years. Uh, we have found several carcinogens that are very active, but often cause you know, large increases in cancers, but rare cancers. So that's one of our real challenges today. How do we find the chemical carcinogens which are present in human populations, but are causing 10, 15% risks in common cancers? And since the 1990s and 19, maybe 2000s, we found a few viruses but somehow we've not been able to find those very effectively. And I would suspect that, a, that this integrative process of epidemiology, combining molecular resources, combining integrated resources will help us do that. But we haven't really found very many. Okay. One short question, no, no one on this side. Okay, there, please. Is there much evidence of um, resistance building up among cancers to treatment in the way that we know that uh, there is uh, resistance to antibiotics in disease and that's so, a viral abs component? Absolutely, there's this, but of course, unlike, because they're not infectious, the resistance doesn't happen across populations. The resistance happens within individual humans. So I suppose we should thank someone for small mercies because if it were infectious, then of course the resistance would spread across from one human being to another, but cancers are largely not infectious, the viruses notwithstanding, they're not largely infectious diseases. So you can't get cross-resistance across a population. What you do get 
however, and it's a big problem, is that the individual cancer cells become resistant to chemotherapies or even targeted therapies. And just to go back to this idea that we were talking about before, now we are reconsidering that whole platform, as it were. We're reconsidering and saying, well, okay, if that's the case, maybe we have to use a combination of targeted therapies to bring down the disease burden, kill the cancer cells, and we have to have something else, a surveillance of some sort, immunotherapy or some other therapy that will, that will change the, the soil, that will change the, the landscape and keep us from having, having that cancer come back or other cancers come back. And I think that's the direction most people are thinking, at least in hematological cancers. Whether this is successful in solid tumors, I still don't know. It's a big mystery. Uh, but I suspect we will solve it. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you so Dr. much. Murphy.